Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Welcome to One to One. The New York City Council recently voted to shut down Rikers Island, the notorious jail complex that in 1991 housed almost 22,000 inmates, and to replace it with four smaller prisons situated around the city by the year 2026. Will this physical change in the city's jail system end the culture of violence and prisoner abuse that has been a hallmark of Rikers Island? And what other reforms are required to create a city prison system that is not only more humane, but more efficient in reducing crime? Martin Horn is well qualified to answer these questions. He's distinguished lecturer in corrections at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice and former commissioner of the City Department of Correction. Welcome. Good to be here. So what do you think of the city's plan to close, to phase out Rikers Island and replace it with four borough-based jails? Well, I think it's, it's a, a great plan as far as it goes. Uh, I'm not sure that four uh, borough-based jails is a magic number. Perhaps the number should be six or even seven. Uh, I'm a little concerned about the uh, size and scale of the proposed jails. But the basic idea of not housing people uh, locked up awaiting trial in New York City on Rikers Island is, uh, at the heart of it, an excellent decision and one that I've uh, supported for many, many years. Partly because now they will be closer to the courthouses and closer to their families? Yes, primarily. Uh, Rikers Island, put, sending... The, the, the individuals on Rikers Island uh, are our neighbors, they're our family members, they're members of our communities, and Rikers Island is a demonizing, stigmatizing place. Uh, it, it, it says um, to, to, uh, to our neighbors that these are individuals who we can't have amongst us. Uh, and I think that's a terrible message to send. It uh, devalues them as human beings. And, as you note, uh, proximity to the court, proximity to their attorneys, proximity to their families, proximity to uh, uh, services uh, is, is critical to um, uh, ensuring that upon their release they are successful, which is ultimately what we want to achieve. The city's jail population has been dropping for years. Uh, right now, uh, about 7,000 are incarcerated on a daily basis in city jails, down from the 22,000 I mentioned in 1991. And city officials are saying they think they can shrink the overall population to 3,300 by 2026. What has caused this reduction in the number of inmates? Well, I think there are uh, several factors, uh, not least of all, I think, is that the city is a much safer place today than it was in 1995. There is less crime. Mostly there is less felony crime, and felonies uh, are the crimes that uh, are more likely uh, to land a person in pretrial confinement than a misdemeanor. Um, the uh, reform of the Rockefeller drug laws, I think you can't ignore that fact. Um, and I think that the changing nature of New York City generally in terms of uh, the uh, immigrant population, uh, uh, the uh, decline of the crack epidemic, uh, all of these things, uh, effective policing, I think, has to take, uh, get some credit. Um, all of these things combine to, uh, to reduce the city's jail population, and that's a good thing. You mentioned the immigrant population, which has grown. Uh, which Are they less are likely to be involved in crime, Based contrary on, to what uh, Donald Trump says? Well, yes. That's his, his, he, I, he's wrong. <laughs> he's wrong. Is what New York is doing, and I know that uh, Oklahoma just released about 500 uh, sort of lower-level inmates from his prisons, um, is this part of a national trend uh, to end mass incarceration? Is that what's happening? Is that part yes, of what I think, New York I is think, doing? People throughout the country, uh, liberals and conservatives, Republicans and Democrats, have realized that locking people up uh, on the scale that we have been doing it uh, was a terrible, terrible social policy and, uh, and a terrible financial investment. We were spending lots of money and uh, not getting uh, very much good in return for it. And I think, uh, you know, to his credit, the, the president uh, supported a bipartisan 
uh, criminal justice reform bill that mostly affects the federal system, not the states. But I think, yes, it is evidence of a national trend uh, to reduce our reliance on incarceration, and that is a good thing. I visited Rikers Island once, and this was back in the late 1970s, and my most vivid impression was that almost all of the inmates were black and Latino men. I mean, you have one white guy here and there, but it was primarily a holding pen for black and Latino men. Is that still the case? And if so, are the jails basically serving as a holding place for men of color that society doesn't know what else to do with it? I think that is certainly uh, true. Uh, it has been my experience. It's an inescapable reality when you're out there. I see the same thing you saw. It continues to this day. And it is, um, I think, a terrible commentary uh, on us as a society uh, that, uh, that our use of incarceration is so disproportionate. Do you see any signs of that changing? Well, I think um, there's some evidence, I know, at the state level that the uh, proportional representation of white inmates versus uh, African-American and Latina uh, Latinx uh, uh, prisoners has shifted. There, there are a higher proportion of white inmates, primarily as a result of the reform of the Rockefeller drug laws. I don't know whether that's happening in the city jails, um, but uh, certainly uh, the war on drugs, disproport the way it was waged in particular, I think uh, had a, uh, a disproportionately harmful effect on communities of color. The news stories about Rikers Island um, that I've been hearing and reading over the last decade seem to be straight out of the prison movies of 1930s. Uh, brutality by prison guards against inmates as well as the inmate on inmate violence. Inmates who have been the victims of sexual assault, of medical neglect, who've been allowed to languish in solitary confinement where some go insane and others commit suicide. And I was horrified, I don't know if this happened in Rikers, I was horrified to read a few months ago about the prison loaf, this horrible concoction that until recently was fed as punishment to inmates in solitary confinement. And it's like, why is this kind of a treatment allowed to go on? For the life of our republic, prisons have been hidden from public view. And I think, again, this is one of the strongest arguments for uh, removing prisoners from Rikers Island and putting the jails in the communities where people come from, uh, where family members and uh, community uh, representatives can bear witness to what's going on. Prisons have always been a hidden world. Um, and the, the unfortunate reality is that we undervalue the correction officers who work in our prisons. They become as um, uh, desensitized uh, as the prisoners themselves. Um, uh, prisons are places of enforced scarcity, and that leads to the creation of a, of a culture that pits the uh, officers against the prisoners. Uh, Placing people uh, in a remote uh, location, such as Rikers Island, demonizes, as I say, the prisoners. And by demonizing them, in some ways, gives implicit permission to the officers to treat them as less than full citizens. And uh, I think uh, it's a confluence of factors. Um, and I've always felt that uh, the work uh, of working in prisons and jails is really a moral calling. And... Um, uh, Oftentimes, that message gets lost uh, in, in, in the, in the, real, the day-to-day -day reality of life in a prison or a jail. It's sometimes said that, you know, one of the reasons Rikers Island has so many problems is it's, it's too big, you know, too, too many inmates. You, you talked about the isolation, but it's that it's too big and overcrowded. Um, but I also read an article recently that said the rate of incidence between correction officers and inmates has gone up even as the jail population has declined. Yes. So um, 
a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one is that uh, as we have reduced the jail population, as you correctly point out, who's left behind, right? Um, we've skimmed off the cream, so to speak. The easy to dispose of cases have been disposed of. And what's left behind are the most difficult, intractable individuals. So the uh, prisoners who remain in custody are the most severely mentally ill and the most violent and dangerous, for the most part. The system's not perfect. There are people who slip through the cracks, certainly. But by and large, what we've done is we've reduced it. So when we do that, um, we should uh, not lose sight of the fact that the officers are dealing exclusively with uh, the most intractable prisoners. Uh, and, and I think that is one of the reasons why that proportionate um, uh, shift has occurred. You talk about the mentally ill, prisoners who are mentally ill. What are they doing in jail? I always ask that question. Jails and prisons, when they were first conceived, were intended for people who were uh, capable of understanding rules and following rules. Many of the people with severe mental illness in our jails lack one or both of those capabilities. And they don't belong in jail. Uh, the jails have become the um, default for a failed mental health system. And because some of these people are dangerous, are difficult to manage in a custodial setting, the mental health system really doesn't want them. And they have abdicated their responsibility. And so ultimately the police are called and the police really only have one thing to do. I know there are efforts afoot to change that, but historically, when the cops come, all they can do is make an arrest. And when they make an arrest, you know, you, you end up in jail. And if you're mentally ill and you act out, you only make your situation worse. And the jails are not equipped, even with all of the investment that's been made uh, to deal with the mentally ill. Quite frankly, if you're mentally ill, you shouldn't be in jail. Period. Stop. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with Martin Horn distinguished lecturer in corrections at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice and former commissioner of the New York City Department of Correction. Welcome back to One to One. I'm talking with Martin Horn, distinguished lecturer in corrections at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice and former commissioner of the New York City Department of Correction. Tell me about some of the reforms that you were able to make when you were corrections commissioner for seven years, and were there reforms you wanted to make but couldn't? <laughs> yes, there were. Uh, I think uh, probably uh, the most important thing that we accomplished was to establish uh, what we referred to as a discharge planning initiative and to recognize that uh, most of the prisoners that we held in custody were returning to our communities. Uh, and to recognize that being locked up, even for three days or five days, if you're a young man, and that's mostly who's in jail, means you lose your job if you had one. If you lose your job, you lose where you're living, you lose your home. Uh, and then when you get out of jail, where do you go? What do you do? So we worked very hard with uh, a large number of uh, uh, not-for-profit social service agencies um, to ensure that from the day an individual came into our jails, we were thinking about where he or she was going to go when they left. We uh, worked with the Corporation for Supportive Housing to create additional supportive housing opportunities. The sad reality of life in New York is that we have an affordable housing crisis. That's no secret. And when you get out of jail or prison, where do you go? What do you do? Uh, there's only so many nights you can sleep on your, the couch at your sister's house before you uh, start to wear on her. Um, so we work very hard to help people leaving our jails find a job, find a place to live, um, and to stay sober. Um, the other thing that we did was we worked very hard, and I think it, it was reflected in the numbers, uh, to address the issue of drug use uh, 
uh, by prisoners in our jails. And we established a very aggressive uh, 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 interdiction policy to keep drugs out of our jails. If jails are not drug free, then they are even more dangerous places. And the numbers, uh, as reflected in the mayor's management report, uh, show that during uh, our term, we actually, uh, the jails actually reached their lowest level of jail violence uh, in history. They've, they've never been as low as they were, and that was with uh, twice as many prisoners as there are there today. We, we, uh, we used a, a CompStat-like approach. We called it TEAMS, uh, and we held the individual uh, jail wardens responsible for the conditions in their jails, and we analyzed every incident of violence in terms of where did it happen, how did it happen, what were the precursor events, how could it have been avoided. The other thing that we did was we reduced suicides in the jails. There were several years during my tenure when we had no suicides, and that was, again, with twice as many prisoners. We worked very hard because I think that the most important thing that I had to do was to make the jails safe. Uh, I don't make, as the correction commissioner, broad criminal justice policy. I don't decide who gets in, I don't decide how long they stay, and I don't decide who leaves. I don't decide who goes to state prison and who goes back to the street. My job is to keep them safe while they're in my custody. We work very hard to make the jail safer and we accomplish that. So I think the discharge planning uh, and the uh, improvement in safety. The other thing that we worked very hard on was we tried to uh, move about 4,000 prisoners off of Rikers Island, modest by uh, comparison to the most recent uh, effort, but it was really uh, the beginning of a citywide discussion. We tried to open a, a new jail in the Bronx and to enlarge the Brooklyn jail, and we ran into a buzzsaw of opposition, and we didn't have the kind of broad-based political support that uh, the Close Rikers campaign uh, has had over the last two or three years. Because nobody wants jails in their... Well, I wouldn't say nobody say wants jails in their community, but a lot of people don't want jails in their communities. And I think that's a, a, a misplaced uh, fear. There's no evidence that uh, uh, jails uh, affect property values. There's no evidence that uh, uh, having a jail in your community makes your community less safe. Uh, there have been jails in, uh, uh, the, the jail in Brooklyn has been there since 1958, and the area around it has grown and become even more valuable. The city seems to be moving away from arresting people from minor offenses like smoking or possessing marijuana. Uh, I assume you think this is a good thing. Should they be doing more of this or, or what? I, I said publicly when I was the commissioner and I continue to say today that no public safety purpose is achieved by locking an individual up for a minor offense for three days or five days. And 25% of the prisoners when I was the commissioner, and I think it's similar today, are in custody for three days or less. And I used to say, what's the point? We're spending lots of money and lots of effort and disrupting lots of lives for very little public safety benefit. So yes, I think that uh, we have to find different ways of responding. We can't ignore these kinds of things. I mean, we can, we can debate legalization of drugs or marijuana, but uh, issues like fair evasion, there have to be consequences. People do have to follow the rules, but uh, incarceration is a very blunt instrument and uh, we should use it less. So anything that leads us, and, and also jails and prisons are nasty places. They're not good under the best of circumstances and they never will be good. And so we'll always have to have them. There are people who are dangerous, but we should be very, very parsimonious about who we send to jail, how often, and for how long. People have been talking about sentencing reform for decades, and you mentioned there have been some changes letting up on the Rockefeller drug laws. I guess some people have been able to appeal their sentences and get out. Um, but is sentencing reform happening in a big way in New York State? No, not really. Uh, the biggest uh, criminal justice uh, reform that occurred was the change the age, which raised the age of criminal responsibility in New York from 16 to 18, um, and that was a good thing. Uh, the, uh, for several years uh, after I left the Correction Department, I served as executive director of a sentencing commission that former Chief Judge Lippman established, and uh, we worked on a proposal that would have reduced the state prison population uh, by uh, 
creating determinate sentences, but there seems to be no appetite in the legislature for broad sentencing reform, and that's an unfortunate reality. You have, you have said that the city needs to reform its bail practices. Now, it seems to me Judge Bruce Wright was talking about that back in the 70s and 80s, and I think Judge Jack Weinstein has been talking about that for a long time. So who's preventing it? Uh, is there any movement to uh, reform bail practices? Well, New York State has just enacted laws that will go into effect January 1st that will represent uh, uh, the most far-reaching reform of uh, our money bail system uh, in, in a generation. Uh, who's opposed to it? Um, prosecutors, police, and the bail industry. The, bail, the money bail industry uh, is a major player a major political contributor, and uh, we often don't think about them. You know, they operate out of storefronts close to the courthouse, but there's a lot of money flowing through there, and uh, there is a constituency for, uh, for continuing the system. And uh, unless and until there is a uh, widespread political belief, and uh, apparently the legislature felt that there was this year, and, and hopefully um, the reforms that they have enacted uh, will have a beneficial effect. Uh, I think we should all recognize that um, none of us is God. No judge, no DA, no defense attorney is God. And there will be people who are released on bail who will go on to do some dastardly deed. It's a risk business, We'd, you know, but we can't keep everybody locked up. And the purpose of bail is not to keep people off the streets. No, it's to, make it's sure to that ensure they, they show up for trial. And as we know, there are many better ways to, to ensure that they show up for trial. In businesses, you have all kinds of training, you know, diversity training, uh, anti-sexual harassment training. Uh, do correction officers need to be trained to treat inmates differently? I think they are trained to uh, treat inmates respectfully and to uh, utilize uh, uh, nonviolent means to obtain uh, conformance to the rules of the jail. I think it's naive to think that the fault lies entirely with officers. Remember, the young men that they're dealing with in the jails are the same ones who have been terrorizing um, housing projects and communities on the street, these gangs, these, uh, these, these uh, 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 teams of young people who can be very aggressive and who are fighting with each other. And oftentimes, it's the correction officer who has to jump in and, and pry them apart. And uh, they then turn on the correction officer and, and so force gets used. More training is always good. Uh, it would be nice if we trained our correction officers uh, the same way we train our police officers. And I think that's a worthy comparison. They are not trained uh, for as long. Uh, they don't have the kinds of uh, training facilities that we give to the police. I think that uh, we undervalue their work and underestimate the difficulty of the work that they do. We have about a minute left, and I'm going to ask you one of the most important questions, something that has always troubled me. Why is the food so bad in correctional institutions? It's difficult to uh, feed, when, when I was there, 16,000 people three times a day. Um, within the budget that you're given. Uh, I think that uh, we worked very hard to make the meals healthful, and they are that. There is no question that in New York City we offer low-fat, low-sodium meals, and, and some people may find that as a result they're tasteless. Uh, but they are healthful. New York City uh, provides nutritious meals. We provide meals that are healthy, um, uh, but they are bland. And, um, and also, you know, the people are, are cycling through. It's, it's, yeah, it would be nice uh, if we could do better. Uh, if that was our biggest problem, I'd say we were in pretty good shape. Okay. Uh, well, so many issues to think about. Uh, such a complicated problem. <laughs> but thank you for um, giving us some more insights. Thanks thank for you. having me. We're out of, I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank Martin Horn.
distinguished lecturer in corrections at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice and former commissioner of the New York City Department of Correction for joining me today. For One to One and the City University of New York, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.